thank you for that kind introduction, Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so my presentation concerns the basic structure doctrine, uh, so-called, as a potential medium uh, through which the purported amendment to the Constitution that will allow for expropriation of health compensation may be challenged and may be set aside in court. So this is very much a legal juristic argument. So this is a brief summary of the paper that you have all received, so I encourage you to please read the, the full paper uh, for more detail, and I will briefly go over that. Um, let me just do a full screen here. Give it a second. There we go. So the basic structure doctrine is an idea with various roots, uh, mostly in the United States and in Germany. Um, unfortunately, Carl Schmitt had a lot to say about it, and I don't like referring to Carl Schmitt for obvious reasons. Uh, but yeah, he, he's one of the authorities on that. Uh, but it first got its uh, juridical expression in India in the 1970s, uh, 1960s. Various other jurisdictions like Belize, which is uh, also on, on similar a similar situation that we have in South Africa land reform, uh, and Uganda, for instance, have also recognized the basic structure doctrine. And pertinently, South Africa, our constitutional court has recognized this doctrine as existing, and maybe it could exist in our law. Um, so let me briefly uh, sketch out the doctrine, the context of how the doctrine came about in India. So after India gained independence from Britain, I think, in 1950, its government, unsurprisingly, as post independent, uh, independent governments tend to do, wished to embark upon a land reform program, uh, much like our own situation in South Africa right after apartheid ended. Uh, so without going into the details of this land reform program, which I'm totally unfamiliar with, it did obviously threaten uh, Indian property owners' rights under the Indian Constitution, which at the time did guarantee property rights as a fundamental right. As a result, the government proposed to amend the Indian Constitution, again much like our present experience. Initially, the Indian Supreme Court found in favor of the government, uh, and we can intuitively agree with that outcome. Uh, this is because one would imagine that an amendment due to a constitution cannot be inconsistent with the constitution itself because it is part of the constitution now. The constitution cannot violate itself because it is as a whole supreme. Um, but this conventional wisdom I don't think is necessarily correct. Starting in 1967, new cases in the Indian Supreme Court started finding otherwise. Uh, the focus shifted very much away from private property rights to a fight between parliamentary and judicial supremacy. In the 1973 case of Kerala, the Supreme Court pertinently held that the amendment power does not include the power to alter the basic structure of the Constitution so as to change the constitutional identity. The general principle was confirmed in repeated subsequent cases. So since 1980, I think of the Minerva Mills case, the basic structure of the Indian constitution today includes such things as liberal democracy, the rule of law, the separation of powers, federalism and secularism, uh, and I think unfortunately socialism as well, which, which we're not going to talk about that. Uh, these values are now protected by the Indian courts against amendments that go too far, as it were. So without further ado, what is the basic structure doctrine then? So we all know that the power to amend the constitution is created by that constitution itself. It is not an inherent authority that legislatures possess by their nature. The legislature is a creature of the constitution, and as a result it is subordinate to, the, to, to that constitution. The amendment power that the legislature possesses is an authority that has been given to that legislature. To put this differently, a constitution is a constituent entity, and a legislature, alongside the very amendment power, are, is constituted, and the amendment power is a power that has been constituted. Legislatures may therefore only exercise constituted powers, powers that it has under the constitution that established it, um, uh, there, there was an expression in the 
Harris case during the constitutional crisis in South Africa, where one of the judges, I don't recall who, uh, condemned Parliament for trying to do something that was outside its powers under the uh, South Africa Act. This is interesting because it's before the constitutional era. And he said something like, the legislature cannot pull itself up by the bootstraps of method and levitate outside of the constitution. And that is essentially the same principle. Uh, the, the legislature exists inside a closed container. It cannot ex uh, be outside of that. So uh, uh, the, the power to make a completely new constitution with its own new identity and its own logic is a constituent power. And usually only the people, uh, uh, trademark, uh, possesses this power. Um, and it's usually the people in a special assembly, for instance, the United States had the Constitutional Convention, South Africa had the Constitutional Assembly and then the certification process by the Constitutional Court. So it's usually a special process that creates new constitutions. Uh, and currently under the South African Constitution, there is no provision, no recognition of the creation of a new constitution. The constitution assumes its own perpetuity. So think, for example, of a speech. Um, I am currently reading a speech to you, which I asked one of my colleagues to check and amend. If my colleague came back with a speech that deals with a totally different topic, or deals with the same topic but concludes the opposite of what I initially concluded, did my colleague really amend the speech? No, they replaced the speech. They exercised a constituent power, not the constituted power that I delegated to them. The basic structure of a constitution is a catch-all term that refers to that constitution's identity, its logic, its most fundamental principles and values. When one thinks of the American Constitution, for instance, one can think of federalism and the protection of individual rights, as Professor Vivian has just indicated to us, as indicative of the identity of that constitution. In South Africa, one can immediately think of non-racialism, given our history, and human dignity as the defining features of our constitution and what it seeks to achieve. If the legislature's amendment makes a change to the uh, basic structure or the identity of a con or the fundamental logic of the constitution, then that legislature is not exercising the amendment power that it has been given in terms of the constitution at all. Uh, rather, the legislature is attempting unlawfully to enact a new constitution, uh, and that is exercising a constituent power that it does not have. Uh, and this is a revolutionary act, it is not a constitutional or a lawful act. And this is important because one of the uh, biggest and repeated criticisms of the basic structure doctrine is that how could you say that parliament cannot amend section 25 or whatever because the constitution says in section 40, uh, 74 that parliament can. Well yes, so the basic structure doctrine does not deny the amendment power at all, not one bit. It does not say that the South African Parliament may not amend Section 25, or even Section 1, which has a super entrenchment. Uh, the Constitution is clear that Parliament may amend the Constitution as it pleases. But the basic structure doctrine is obsessively concerned with ensuring that when Parliament purports to amend the Constitution, what it is doing is in fact an amendment, and not a new Constitution, which is a power that the Constitution does not give Parliament. It does not have the power to enact a new Constitution, and that is uh, beyond dispute, I believe. So what the content of the basic structure of the South African Constitution is, is slightly outside the scope of this presentation. I think our concern is specifically with property rights, and moreover the, moreover the right to receive compensation upon expropriation of your property. Um, and we need to determine whether that is in fact part of the constitutional logic, and I will present a brief argument for why in fact it is. Uh, so Professor Vivian has already made a strong argument, in my view, for why property rights and individual liberty are in fact an inherent feature of constitutionalism and that you can't have a constitution that violates these, these values because then it's not a constitution anymore. So Professor Kues Malan, who was going to join us here today but unfortunately was away, uh, made a very similar argument to Parliament uh, when the Chamber of Commerce Sakalika presented on expropriation of health compensation. I will turn to that briefly in a second. But before turning to property rights, I think it's important to ask whether the basic structure doctrine uh, would apply in South African law. Um, 
uh, there are three cases from the Constitutional Court that I think imply that it would. So an executive council of the Western Cape Legislature or its president of South Africa, uh, it's a 1995 case under the interim constitution, Justice Sachs expressed the view that, for instance, if parliament attempted to amend the constitution to abolish itself, parliament, to take out, I think it's chapter four nowadays, or to give itself eternal life, like abolish elections, uh, Sachs said that that would probably conflict with the basic structure of South Africa's constitution and that the court probably would not allow parliament to enact such an amendment, even if it complies with the, the, um, the provisions of the constitution that sets out how to amend the constitution. Uh, a year later, in premier of Kwazulu Natal, where he's president of South Africa, Justice Mohammed said that uh, there may be circumstances where amendments to the constitution that do comply with the amendment procedure nonetheless fail to qualify as amendments per se, uh, because they radically or fundamentally restructure or reorganize the fundamental premises of the constitution. Uh, in uh, 2002, in the second UDM case, the basic structure doctrine was again just assumed to apply, but the court did not finally decide the issue as it was not pertinent. So in each of these three cases, uh, the basic structure doctrine came up, but the court said that in, in the present facts this is not really relevant, but what the court did say on the basic structure doctrine does seem to imply that if it is pertinent, it would apply in South African law. Uh, so to me it's clear that uh, the basic structure doctrine does apply in South African law and, and hopefully will be recognized by the courts if presented to with that argument. Um, but none of this obviously matters if uh, property rights, and specifically the right to uh, receive compensation, is not regarded as part of the basic structure of the doctrine, uh, as I argue that it is. Now I, can, I cannot say definitively that it is, but this is my argument. So property rights are necessary for the realization of almost all the other rights in the Bill of Rights. Uh, think about the right to privacy, the right to human dignity, for instance, uh, can, you, uh, the, can you have your human dignity recognized when you don't have a home, when you live on state land and every day presents the threat that President Malema might uh, take your property from you by ending your lease. Um, the right to housing, obviously, uh, the right to freedom of expression, uh, do you truly have a right to freedom of expression if you can't own a podium, if you can't own a laptop, if you can't own um, a microphone to uh, express your views, own the clothing on your back, uh, education, healthcare? None of these rights would make sense without some kind of proprietary basis. There's no right to healthcare without hospitals, which are property. Uh, there is no right to privacy without assuming that some things, and specifically some spaces, are our own and may not be in there. <coughs> Property rights are also necessary for civil society and the very notion of citizens, citizenship itself to have a meaningful content. And this is Professor Malan's argument. Without private property and without a landed citizenry, government's property uh, power expands significantly and with, uh, without property the people become entirely dependent on the state to realize their potential. We can, uh, we can also think about the centrality of property rights to the negotiated settlement. Uh, would we even have our current constitution if property rights were not securely protected in it? Would there have been the agreement by all the relevant parties that we can move forward with the constitution? I think no. Uh, uh, without property rights, there would not have been a constitution. And to me, that indicates its fundament fundamentalness to the, uh, the very constitution itself. And then there are various provisions throughout the constitution that assume the existence of property rights, uh, secure property rights. So we have already referred to the right to privacy in section 14b which says that you have, you, uh, you have a right not to have your property searched, uh, without a warrant, of course. Section 205, which regulates the police service, also says that it is a function of the police to protect people and their property. Uh, so one can imagine if we have expropriation of health compensation and the police come to escort you off your property, uh, that, that uh, perverts Section 205. Uh, uh, Anfia referred to a a situation where that happened, where 
the police stood idly by uh, watching as someone's property rights were violated. And I think that happens very often with land grabs in South Africa. So it's a total state of anarchy as far as Section 205 of the Constitution is concerned already. Chaos, not anarchy. Uh, section 228 and 229, which deal with taxes, also make uh, reference to provincial and municipal rates on property. So the Constitution variously assumes that there exist property rights in South Africa, and I think by necessary implication, property rights need to be secure for them to make any sense. So I think from all of this, a cogent argument can be made that property rights, and I think by necessary implication, the right to receive adequate compensation upon expropriation, are part of the basic structure of the Constitution. Uh, this is especially pertinent when one bears in mind that Section 1A of the Constitution also says that South Africa is founded upon the advancement of human rights and freedoms, not the undoing or the undermining of human rights and freedoms. And the Constitution 18th Amendment Bill absolutely undermines human rights and freedoms. No argument can be made that the 18th Amendment Bill, which is the bill that provides for expropriation without compensation, fits into this notion that South Africa is engaged in the advancement of human rights and freedoms. It's totally uh, 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 contrary to that. Uh, and the bill does this by introducing a parliamentary discretion to determine by a simple parliamentary majority, 50% plus one, when compensation will be payable. Uh, this, in effect, I think, abolishes the higher level of constitutional protection against mollified expropriation that all South Africans have enjoyed since 1994. I think that we can keep the right to property 25, um, but if we have this proviso hidden in the text saying that, by the way, your property may be taken for nothing if Parliament deems it so, then that renders the whole Section 25 idea uh, redundant and useless. Uh, so if, if we take away the right to receive ad adequate compensation. I think we've effectively taken away the right to private property, per se. So in my view, the basic structure doctrine can be employed as a legal argument to have the Superior Court set aside the amendment bill for not being an amendment at all, but rather an unlawful attempt to create a new constitutional order. And I think, uh, I think most people would intuitively agree with this. One day you go to bed knowing that, theoretically at least, the government must protect your private property, and the next morning after the amendment has been adopted, there is no such entitlement or right exists anymore. You effectively live in a completely new constitutional order. So the, big, the biggest question, I think, is whether the constitutional court, which has a, an incredibly bad record, on uh, protecting, say, uh, specifically Section 25, uh, will see it this way. Um, but that is a matter for practicing advocates to surmount. Uh, what I do want to encourage you is to not be too conservative. I think that if we go with excessively technical arguments, as South African lawyers tend to do, uh, it might at best be a delaying action. I think we need to attack expropriation without compensation at a very fundamental level um, to ensure that if we win, which is a big if, um, that it's gone forever, that it can't keep coming back every five years with another speech and then another attempt to amend it. Uh, I, I think it needs to be ended per se uh, as soon as we possibly can. And that will take some thinking outside of the box. Um, I think. Let's stop looking at British cases. Let's start looking at American constitutional law a bit more, where I think uh, their lawyers tend to be a bit more creative in how to employ their constitution, how to employ uh, principles of constitutionalism that are not written down in the constitution itself to fight an overbearing state. I think that is that could be useful for us. Um, thank you very much for your time, and I am happy to take questions if anyone has some.
Uh, to my mind, any kind of attack really requires a number of different kinds of options. I think options are organization things. Um, seem like there's a, you know, a range of troops that are willing to, uh, to protect us. And the two arguments that spring to mind, the one is one that you've written about in follow detail, which is the Section 1C of the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the rule of law uh, is a sacrosanct value in the Constitution. And that the rule of law is not just about procedure, it implies some substance. Um, and there is some case law which implies the rule of law requires the protection of fundamental rights, and that ties up with uh, basic structure style. Yeah. Uh, and the other one, um, if you look at section 36 of the Constitution, which is this proportionality inquiry, if you're going to limit any right from of rights, you have to go through this uh, proportionality inquiry. Uh, I've made the argument that if you are going to have an amendment to the Constitution, that itself is a law of the application. And, the proportionality test uh, inside section 36. And if it cannot do that, um, then it must fail on its face. So then you've sort of got a force field at play. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said for thinking about, you said, thinking out of the box, yeah. coming up with different solutions to tackle this issue. And some of it is going to be found uh, in areas that South African lawyers don't yeah. have to look for. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think the um, uh, to find a textual provision in the Constitution itself, uh, I, I've relied for the basic structure doctrine on uh, 1674D, and that provides that only the Constitutional Court may decide on the constitutionality of any amendment to the Constitution. And I found this interesting because many provisions uh, of the Constitution and of legislation would, for instance, say, uh, if we take this example, only the Constitutional Court may decide the constitutionality of an amendment to the Constitution in terms of this and that, in terms of a different provision. But this one, it ends there. It says any amendment to the Constitution, period. So it's not referential. It doesn't say that this has to happen for the Constitutional Court's authority to come about. It seems to me to be an unqualified power that the, con that the Constitution gives to the Constitutional Court to look at the validity of any Constitution on any grounds in the Constitution. So I think this could be used for the basic structure doctrine, and I think, interestingly, it could also be employed for your Section 36 argument, uh, because Section 36 does, it only deals with government limiting rights and not necessarily with an amendment to Section uh, to Chapter 2 to the Bill of Rights, but this provision might, might bring about the situation where the court can say, hang on, the values in Section 36 are actually they have a, a broader application. Uh, the, op the idea of an open and democratic society is a fundamental value, uh, in fact, and, and we will uh, enforce that. Um, the preamble, I think you, at some uh, at past point, also indicated that the preamble could also be used, and I've, I've thought about that. And I think Sachs in, I think it's State versus Mshlungu, yeah, he says, the preamble in particular should not be dismissed as a mere aspirational and throat-clearing exercise of little interpretive value. It connects up, reinforces, and underlies all the text that follows. It helps to establish the basic design of the Constitution and indicate its fundamental purposes. So one can also have a look at that and say, uh, and I, I'm not familiar with the exact text of the preamble, but I think it says something about recognizing the injustices of the past and we will create a society based, I, I think they unfortunately use the term social justice, which is unfortunate, but we can, I think we can make an argument saying that if we look at South African history, what is the number one injustice of our past? The Natives Land Act, the Group Areas Act, these laws fundamentally deprived millions of South Africans of their property rights, and I think in many cases amounted to expropriating their property without compensation in the past. So we can say, hey, the preamble says we need to recognize legally, constitutionally, we need to rec recognize the injustice of our past, and we need to make sure that that doesn't happen again. What is the Constitution 18th Amendment Bill doing? It is doing exactly what the apartheid state did by taking land without compensation, and if the government, as it says it would, enforces these new laws on a racial basis, then there's even a, a bigger argument to be made for why the preamble should be employed in that fashion. And then, of course, I think Professor Vivian or Rex will be talking on, um, 
on section one later. But I think that's that's the the alternative argument to also be made. Uh, the idea that you cannot say that South Africa is founded upon the supremacy of the constitution and rule of law, or that it is founded on the, upon the supremacy, uh, the advancement of human rights and freedoms. And then what you do is you literally repeal an established right in the Bill of Rights, which is the right to receive compensation. I don't think you can make that argument uh, uh, without uh, being ridiculous. Uh, so if we take Section 1 seriously, then we can't have expropriation without compensation. Any other questions? Comments, concerns, criticisms? If you think this is nonsense, please tell me. I, it's important to know. Adam. Um, the preamble also says, you know, something along the lines of South Africa belongs to all who live in it. Mm. Don't you risk, um, if you, if you, you know, amp up the interpretive value of the preamble, don't you risk running into that um, sentence coming back to bite you? Yes, yeah, no, that, that's a fair point. I, I think uh, if, if a reasonable interpretation of it belongs to all of us is more of a, a, I guess, a philosophical idea that we're all we're all in this together and we all like we can all be here if we want to be here. Uh, but obviously, when you use a proprietary word like belongs, it's very much a, a I think a term recognized in law as uh, uh, implying that you own something. So, yeah, that is a risk. That's definitely a risk. And I think the basic structure doctrine also runs the risk of. If we get it recognized, then um, people may bring the Indian thing in and say, but socialism is also part of the basic structure of the Constitution. That's, that's, a, that's certainly a risk, although I think it's, it, it, it will be a more difficult argument. So I'm very much of Professor Vivian's school of thought, where constitutionalism is, a, in my view, a totally classically liberal thing. This is something that is owned by classical liberals. Uh, the ideas of constitutionalism are ours and ours to define. Uh, you can't bring socialism into our ideas, sorry. Um, but <laughs> you run the risk of that, and we've seen the constitutional court, unfortunately, has, uh, especially of Agri SA, has been very keen on, on saying things that are totally anti constitutional. So that, that's absolutely a risk we should be mindful of. Anything else? No? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.